All right, good evening everyone. My name is Bill Clace. I'm a UW Extension Natural Resources Educator and tonight we're going to be talking about those things that are killing our trees out there. And uh, so we'll look at some of the signs and symptoms of the things that are killing our trees and then we'll be able to identify, identify some of those. We'll talk about some of the worst things that are out there and uh, we'll go through, uh, we'll talk a little bit about who you can contact to get help. And then those people are out there and they're free so I encourage you to reach out to them even if you just have a question. Some of the things we're not going to talk about are the, the insects and diseases that are very common in our woods, that are out there all the time, that don't really cause a problem. And this is a good example of that. This is the eastern tent caterpillar. Can you guess why it's called the eastern tent caterpillar? It creates a little tent that it's, uh, it rears its, its young in. It's common in Wisconsin's forest, in, in the forest in the northeastern part of the country and, and the continent. It's not really that damaging. It, uh, it will eat a lot of the leaves on a tree, but overall it's not as it's not as bad as things like gypsy moth and emerald ash borer and oak wilt, some of the things you may have heard of already. So I'm not going to talk about these. There are, those things are out there. They do cause damage, but they're overall, the, na the native predators that are out there do a good job of controlling their populations. But the, the things that are out there that are really bad that we have problems with because there's no natural predators are the ones that we're going to talk about tonight. So here are your steps to having a healthy forest. This is a good one. Learn what's out there and why they're problematic and where they are and what the signs and symptoms are. And be able to evaluate your forest as a whole and not just think about one tree that looks sick. Ask for some assistance. There's professionals out there, usually they're free. And keep your forest healthy. All right, that's it for the evening. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> now we'll go into more detail. So the key for keeping your forest healthy and, and the characteristics of a healthy forest are that it has many plant species, a lot of diversity. I'm going to mention that a lot through tonight's lecture, that there's a lot of diversity in a forest. It's resilient to the attack of maybe one kind of pest or insect or disease. So the more diversity you have in your forest, the better off you'll be. If it's not crowded, too, that you have, the trees have space to grow so they're not stressed because they're all fighting for the same resources. Stressed trees tend to attract insects and diseases and be susceptible to those things. It's complex that you have a variety of different species and you have shrubs and ground cover along with big trees and small trees. All that diversity tends to attract wildlife that eat the insects that are attacking our trees. And it meets your management objectives. That's a key one. It always should be, you know, what are your goals should be the first thing you ask. And then trying to keep your forest healthy is, is part of those goals overall. And there's a lot of tools you can use to keeping your forest healthy. You can thin your forest. That, so that you make room for your good trees to grow, so that they stay healthy and resilient. Rotation age is a fancy term that foresters use. It just means that uh, the trees have reached their economic maturity and so you should harvest them. Or their maturity so that after that, after that point, they're, they continue to grow, but their growth has really slowed. And so that's the age that it's a good time to harvest your trees. And for some trees, it can be 100, 200 years. For other trees, it can be like 40 years. And aspen is a good example of that. There's some really old aspen out there, but we usually harvest it at around 40 years because that's when it's most mature, it reaches highest value, and after that, it's going to start to decline a bit. Choosing the right species for the site is a good thing to do. You know, you match the, the trees that you want on your property with the soil type you have and the conditions you have. A good example might be that I live in Rhinelander and I live in a sandy soil. I wouldn't, a bad idea would be to try to grow walnut there, which prefers southern climes and richer soil. So that's a really bad choice. The trees wouldn't do well and the trees that do survive would probably be attacked by insects and diseases. And it's a good idea to leave some of those dead and dying trees out there. Not a lot, just a few, because they tend to attract things like woodpeckers and other flying, other birds, flying birds, there's a redundant thing. Other birds that uh, eat insects. And that's, those are great things because they'll attack the insects that are eating or, or feeding on your trees. So you want a few of those out there, but not too many. And if you do, an do have an infestation, you might need to do what's called an eradication cut. Get rid of those trees, get them off your property so that don't, the insects and diseases that are on there don't infect the rest of your forest. And it, all these tools you might be able to do yourself, but I encourage you to use a forester to help you to, um, to make sure you get exactly what you need done out of it. And it works well. So now we're going to put on our deerstalker cap. Is that right? Is that what Sherlock Holmes wears, a deerstalker cap? Someone told me last night, and I, and I forgot already. You're going to be able to figure out, by based on the things that you see going on, 
you might be able to figure out what's going on in your forest. There's a lot of things to consider. You know, what, what kind of tree is it? What are the things you're seeing in the way of signs and symptoms? What's going on with the leaves and needles and the, and the branches and the trunk? And can you see death or mushrooms growing out of the roots? Or can you actually find some insects on there? Or what's going on with the site? There's a lot of things to consider. And we'll talk about each of these. One big thing to consider is that you need to look beyond just one symptom because that might not be the, the sole source of what's going on. You might see leaves wilting, but it might, be, it might not be a, a leaf disease. It might be something going on with the roots. Or there might be something going on, maybe some big machinery had, you had on your property had killed the roots, and that's what's killing the tree, or the, even though it looks like something's eating the leaves on your tree. So you have to think about your site as a whole and what's been going on over the past few years. And it might be something else beyond just uh, an insect or a disease, if you had planted the trees, a very common thing is we improperly plant trees, and so that can kill a tree just as fast as a deer eating it. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, planting a tree and how to do it correctly so that you don't, so that the trees grow well. So here's an example of why you need to think about and know your trees that are out there. This is a white pine, and you see in the middle there, there's some yellow needles, right? And your first reaction might be like, ah, that doesn't look healthy, something's going on there, these leaves are turning yellow, that doesn't seem right. A healthy tree, it's an evergreen tree, it should have green needles all the time, right? But actually that's a common occurrence with pine species, that they don't keep their leaves forever, their needles, forever, they last about two to three years, and then they drop them, either because the needles have gotten too old or they're too shaded. And so this is commonly, the, the needles will turn yellow on white pine like this, and they'll drop just to make room for the, for the young needles coming in. So it's, it may look like there's something wrong with the tree, but actually it's perfectly all right. And the more you know about your trees and watch what's going on, the more you'll be able to see that this is okay. There's nothing wrong with this, and this is just a natural thing. All right, so here's, I talked about signs and symptoms. Here's how we define them. A symptom is the response of the tree to something that's attacking it. It might be the needles turning a different color, or the leaves turning a different color, or wilting. The sign is actually the pest itself. It might be a mushroom, it might be the insect, it might be um, the insect or the damage done by the insect, like the galleries underneath the bark, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So let's go through a few of these. So you can see the needles on this, uh, this spruce are kind of turning brown. And it might look, you might think, well, what's going on there? Is, what kind of damage could that be? Is it, and there's a couple of possibilities. It, is it possible that there was some too much fertilizer? Or you planted them in the wrong site and there's not enough fertilizer in the, in the soil for the tree to do well? Or maybe there's some kind of fungal disease. There's a number of different things that could cause the needles to turn color like this. Or maybe the leaves are wilting, like in this aspen. That could be frost damage. Or again, it could be some kind of fungal disease. But, no, but seeing that and identifying what the damage is is the first step in this process. Or maybe there's just some kind of deformity in the trunk, and this is a good looking uh, canker on here, isn't it? It's got a lot of character, right? And it, it's very much more interesting than a perfectly straight tree that has no damage. But this is, this is pretty obviously something's wrong with this tree. It's not growing very well, and it probably won't do very well in the long run. Now we talked about the signs, it can, be, it can take a lot of different forms. In this picture, you can see the egg mass for a gypsy moth. And also you can see some of the larvae coming out of that egg mass. And then the lower left-hand corner is the, the pupil case for the, the gypsy moth. So that's something to keep an eye out for. And those egg masses are pretty common on gypsy, uh, trees that are infested with, with gypsy moth. So it's something, one of those signs to keep an eye out for in case you're worried that gypsy moth might be attacking your forest. Another thing you can look out for is uh, these, these insect tunnels. And this is feeding, uh, this is damage caused when an insect or a larvae feeds underneath the bark in the growing tissue on, right underneath the bark called the cambium. And that's a really rich nutrition area, nutritious area of the tree. And the insects are eating that. And they create these tunnels or galleries, like in this picture. And this is from a pine engraver beetle. And it's very common kind of, uh, or I should say that each insect has a distinct kind of gallery they they create in their feeding in the way they feed. And I'll show, when I show you a picture of the emerald ash borer, the, the gallery is very different than this one. And a frass is insect poop. And that's what you can see in the picture. 
That's a little bit of sawdust too, but that's the, the, you could find that too when you're looking, for, like you might see the tree dying and you pull the bark off and you see the galleries and a little bit of sawdust and poop. That's what, much, what you might be seeing. And a hole like it's in this picture is a good indication of uh, some kind of insect has bored into the tree or bored out of the tree as it, as it became an adult. It's a good thing to keep an eye out for. In some cases, there's so many holes, it looks like the, the tree was shot with a shotgun and it's, it's all little holes from shot. And some of the holes are very distinctive in shape. Some of them are shaped like a D, and some of them are very round. And the D-shaped hole is very characteristic of a couple of insects that I'll talk about. Or maybe you see the cankers or the fruiting body of the mushrooms or the fungus that's growing in a tree. And this doesn't look very obvious that it's a mushroom, but in fact that little bit of yellow on the side of that uh, aspen is the fruiting body of a certain kind of hypoxylin canker. And it's it doesn't seem like it's much, but that can be killing the tree pretty readily. Now the tree, the picture on the top is the tree is snapped over and your first thought might be, well, that looks like it was wind damage. But in fact, the tree was probably healthy before it was infected with the mushroom, the picture in the bottom. And this particular fungus infests the whole part of the tree. And so that weakens the stem. And so it's very easy for it to be snapped over by the wind because of that. Really characteristics for this particular fungus. Now the location of the damage is also another clue that will help you figure out what's going on with uh, what's causing the damage to your tree. Like in this picture you can see the leaves in the lower part of the tree are starting to fall off or disappear. And that's usually an indication of some kind of uh, leaf infection because the bottom part of the tree is where the, the highest humidity is. And that's a good conditions for growing different kinds of uh, leaf damaging diseases and fungus. Now, if the leaves or needles are dying at the top, it could be a number of different things. It could be root damage, maybe from drought or maybe from some kind of root disease. Or it could be something eating the top part of the leaves, the insects that like to be in the sun. And in this red pine stand, you can see the tops of the trees are kind of getting thinner. Or it could be some kind of fungal wilt, like in this picture. Anybody have oak wilt on their property? I'm um, sorry to hear that. Um, you, might be, you might have seen a picture like this or seen oak trees like this on your land. Now, if you've got expanding pockets of dying trees, that can be something completely different. It could be a fungal root infection from a number of different uh, agents that are out there that can be killing your trees. It could be armillaria, oak, oak wilt, anosum, Dutch elm disease, depending on what species you have and what, what that expanding pocket looks like. It could be any one of those. It could even be something like bark beetles if it's a pine tree. Now if you got damage to many different species of trees, it could be something that you did inadvertently. And, this, and in these pictures, uh, we have a white pine, a hemlock, and a balsam fir that have damage. The, the needles are all turning brown. It doesn't seem right that something would attack a bunch of different trees. And what happened in this case is that the, the person was spraying buckthorn with an herbicide on a windy day and herbicides spread and killed these other trees. So it was something that person did rather than an insect or a disease. So all of these are more things to consider when you see, don't just say, oh, I got a tree dying. Think about what's going on. If you can find any of the signs or symptoms of, of what kind of damage it is, where the damage is, will tell you a lot about what it might be. And not just, oh, I got, my needles are turning brown. It's gotta be this. There's more of a bigger story than just that. And knowing the site history is important too. Um, if, you might have had heavy equipment on your property for whatever reason, or maybe you had animals grazing on it beyond deer. Uh, there could be some weather damage, or there's all kinds of different things that can lend to this story that's going on in your property. In this particular case, it looks like the top of the trees were just snapped off, like it was just the wind damage. But in fact, there was a lot going on on this site. Uh, here's the sequence of what happened. The first year, it, it had a really heavy drought, so the trees were already stressed by that drought. They survived. And then the next four years, there was an insect infestation that was defoliating the trees. And somehow they survived. And then a year after that, there was another drought. And still they survived. They were very growing very slowly. You can see they're kind of stunted trees. And then so when a strong wind came through it, it snapped the trees right off. And so your first thought might be wind damage. But there's a lot going on here that led to those trees being stressed and weakened so that they're susceptible to wind damage. Because most trees should be able to handle some heavy wind. Really heavy wind is different. And knowing if there has been big infestations in the past. And this good looking uh, bug here is the forest tent caterpillar. It's got some really distinctive features on it. If you 
if, uh, if you look, some people say, if you look at the, the, the pattern on its back, some people say those are footprints kind of going up its back or keyholes on their back. Really, it's a native species. I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. It's common in our forests. It's there all the time. But every 6 to 10 years, or 6 to 16 years, their populations just explode. And you can see in the graph that in the early aughts, their population, they had a really big population boom. And so we're kind of due for another of these soon. But they're around all the time. They're just in low population levels. And what happens is that they get this big population boom, and then all of a sudden there's all these predators out there that are just munching them up, and their population crashes again. All right, so let's go through some of the insects, insects and diseases that are out there that are problems. You can see we'll talk about these other things as well that are affecting your trees. Uh, and a poor planting is there at the bottom. I don't mean to imply that you plant trees poorly, but there's, well, there was a lot of peas in that statement. But there's, uh, there's things, simple things you can do that will to make this tree planting very successful. So in general, we like to call things pests, but in fact, there's, there's only a very small percentage of the insects and diseases out there that are really a problem, less than 1%. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of, of insects in our forests. Most of them are very benign and do, do uh, generally a, ben a benevolent, benevolent job out there. They provide food for uh, wildlife, and they break down matter so that it decomposes faster. But only a small percentage are a problem, and um, I'm gonna be plugging this website a lot, the DNR website, and you do a search on the search, or type in forest health in the search bar. The forest, that section of the DNR website has a lot of great information, a lot more detailed information about each of these pests I'm gonna talk about. So I encourage you, if you wanna get some more detailed information, to go there. I'm gonna be talk, I'm mentioning this a couple times throughout the presentation. It's dnrwi.gov, and type in forest health. A lot of great information. So for insects, there's all kinds of different ways we categorize them. How they feed, you know, what they're feeding on, what stage they're in. How, all these things are, help us to identify what they are and uh, if we need to worry about them or not. Let's start with those insects that eat that part right underneath the bark. We call those girdling insects because as they chew on that growing tissue right underneath the bark, they end up killing the tree by uh, all that growing tissue and that living tissue is what transports water up from the roots and nutrients down to the roots. And if you cut that off, you're basically choking the light out of the tree. And so they're girdling the tree. They're, they're killing all the tree, uh, the, uh, basically a ring around the tree that's cutting off that flow. And a two-line chestnut border is one of those kind of insects. This is the kind of galleries it creates in the picture. Uh, it's a good-looking worm. It's got uh, different segments, kind of rounded on both ends. When I talk about the emerald ash borer, it's going to look a little bit different than this one. That's why I want to start with this picture because, so you can get a look at it because you might see damage that's similar to an emerald ash borer, or you might think it's an emerald ash borer, you might think it's oak wilt, especially for the two-line chestnut borer. And so it's good to know what this bug looks like. But we'll start with the emerald ash borer. This is typical uh, reaction to a tree that's under attack from the emerald ash borer. You'll get this epicormic sprouting. We talked about that uh, a couple weeks ago. All the branches might die, but then you'll get new branches coming up along the stem of the tree. Here's what the galleries look like in the left-hand picture. They kind of make a spike or a back and forth up, the, up and down the tree. Uh, they produce this, when they drill into the tree and, and exit from the tree, they produce a D-shaped hole. The bronze birch borer also produces a D-shaped exit hole. If you're looking, if you see damage to a birch tree and you see those holes, you know exactly what it is. It's called the bronze birch borer. Here's the adult on the left. Uh, that's not a that is a normal sized penny. <laughs> it's actually kind of an iridescent green color. I've got some good handouts on it, and the DNR website has some good identification handouts too. The larvae has the segments. I think they look like bells, like church bells, is a good way to think about it. So when you're, if you think you got an elm that's infested with it, if you pull off the bark and you find larvae that look like this, it's those are emerald ash borer. You might not see the adult, but you might see the larvae. Here's how widespread emerald ash borer infestation is across the U.S. Uh, it's, it's only in part of the Wisconsin, but it's slowly, it'll probably get every, into every county of the state, unfortunately. These are only the infestations that we know about. There might be others that we don't within the state. So even if your county is not listed as has, having inf, emerald ash borer, that's okay. It, or it might have it, it just hasn't been found yet. I think the only thing that's going to stop it is the, great, the prairies to the west of us. 
and the, the Rocky Mountains or when there's no more elm. <laughs> That's what's going to stop these guys from getting everywhere in the U.S. Here are the counties and the quarantines that are in place for removing firewood. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the restrictions for removing firewood in a few minutes. But here's where the infestation is. You notice that Oneida County, that one lone uh, red county in the middle of the state, that's the Rhinelanders in Oneida County. I swear it wasn't me that brought Emerald Ash Borer into Oneida County. I swear. You'll see Oakwood is up there too. It wasn't me. So if you think you have it, uh, the first thing to do is to call someone and, and see if they can uh, confirm that you do have it. And I encourage you to go to the DNR website and type in Forestry Assistance Locator. And then you can pick the county that your land is located in. And, and when you choose that, you'll get the contact information for the DNR foresters that work there. They want to know if you do have it. And even if, you don't, if they find out you don't have it, that's great. They, then they can say it either way. So there's no uncertainty. So give them a call. Uh, the Ember Last Boar website in Wisconsin has a lot of great information as well, including identification and, and, uh, and similar bugs that are out there and damage that's out there that could be. So if you're unsure or you want to do the own investigation yourself, that's a good place to go. You can also report it via telephone or at the DATCAP, Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection, Emberlash Borer at Wisconsin.gov. You can send them an email too if you think you have it. Now, bark beetles are another uh, girdling insect. Their galleries, the picture on the right, are a little bit different than the emerald ash borer. Um, they're very distinctive. You can see the adult lays eggs in, those, in those, uh, those big galleries, and then the eggs hatch, and they make the smaller galleries that, as they mature, or the larvae mature. And it creates a, a, a pocket of damage that slowly spreads. And it usually starts from uh, lightning struck, trees, any kind of stressed trees. In fact, bark beetles are a unique bug in that they're attracted to trees that are stressed. Now, when trees are stressed, they release a hormone that tends to um, attract some insects. And bark beetles are one of those insects that are attracted to trees that are stressed. And so if you can keep your trees from getting stressed, you'll be less likely to get a bark beetle infestation, especially if you have pine on your property. So here's the prevention. Thin your trees so that they have room to grow and don't become stressed because they're too crowded. And uh, if you can, do the thinning between November and April so that you don't create wounds. And uh, even a stump is basically a wounded tree. If you cut down the tree and leave the stump, that stump is, there's still, it's a living uh, organism. The roots are still alive. It's still alive, basically. It just doesn't have the top of its body that's, that's producing sugars to help the, the tree grow. So it's an open wound, basically, that's attracting bugs. If, but if you thin it or cut down those trees in between November and April when they're dormant, you have less likely that you're going to um, attract those insects because it's a dormant tree. And if you, when you do harvest the trees, get them off your property as soon as you can because those logs are still alive for a long time after they've been cut. And they're, it's an open wound that's going to attract bugs. So you get them off your property quickly and you have less chance of getting bark beetles on your property. And promote diversity as much as you can. If you have 40 acres of red pine that your grandpa planted or someone planted in your family or you're planting, try to mix in some other species. I'm going to mention promote diversity a number of times through the presentation. I can't say it enough that that's really an important part of keeping your forest healthy and keeping the bug and insect populations to a minimum. And if you do have an infestation, harvest those trees that uh, get them off your property as soon as you can. Okay, let's move on to uh, those insects that eat the leaves of our trees called defoliating insects. And gypsy moth is one of those that's a big problem. Here's a nice picture of a tree that isn't looking too good with a few gypsy moths eating the scraps of what's left of the leaves. Often they'll eat all the leaves of trees. And um, of many of the species, they have a lot of species that pr they prefer to feed on. Here are the different stages of their life cycle on the right. The uh, male and female are different colored moths. They lay the egg masses kind of have a tan color. The, uh, the, the larvae are very distinctive. They have pairs of red dots on the bottom part and pairs of blue dots towards the top, and they have a kind of woolly look to them. They actually spread, the larvae spread, have a really unique way that they can go from one tree to another. They, they put out some thread or silk. They get to the top of the tree, put out the silk, and that silk catches, catches the wind and carries them from one tree to another up to like 100 feet or something. It's pretty amazing. Excuse me. Here is the quarantine counties for gypsy moth. Um, it's, you can see it's slowly working its way westward. Uh, it'll probably 
eventually cover the whole state with infestation. We're doing some, uh, the DNR and DATCAP are doing some spraying for gypsy moth. They're trying to slow the spread and keep the populations down so that they're to a reasonable amount so they don't do as much damage as they possibly could. And earlier I talked about uh, the quarantines for moving firewood. Here's a, here's a graphic of that. The idea is that you can move firewood if you move it within areas, if you're in an infested area, you can move it within all those counties that are, have already have the infestation, so you don't have to worry about uh, spreading an infestation, far, infestation farther. Uh, but if you're going to a county like those white counties that don't have any infestation with things like gypsy moth and emerald ash borer, then they'd prefer, we prefer that you didn't move firewood into there and maybe spread an infestation. You'll see that Oneida County is green in here. I swear it wasn't me. Um, so. Keep that in mind. If you got firewood, a lot of people have live in a city, they cut down a tree in their yard, and they want to take it up and burn it on their property somewhere else. I, don't do that. If you can, uh, the police can stop you and, and fine you. They have a lot of high priorities in their lives already, and uh, checking to see if you're moving firewood too far is probably not one of them, but they, that can happen. So I'm, I encourage you to keep your wood, firewood on your property and burn it there, or get rid of it uh, within the city. As I said, gypsy moth will uh, feed on a number of different species, a lot of species. In fact, I was going to put a whole list on the slide, but there was just too many. There's a lot of species that it feeds on, but there is a small number that it tends to avoid. And if you have a diversity of these different species on your property, you'll have some that'll do well and help to break up your forest so that the whole thing isn't getting munched on by gypsy moth. It's a good idea to look for these in uh, mid-May, these bugs. If you have big infestation, they won't be hard to find. So uh, some management for gypsy moth is to thin your forest. Get rid of those suppressed and intermediate trees, the ones that, uh, that, that just removes a food source for the gypsy moth. And they can be sometimes unhealthy, so it's, uh, uh, they might not survive an attack, less of a food source. So it's, it's, it's a balance you have to have when you think about if you do have a gypsy moth or you, there's gypsy moth nearby, you might be more diligent or more proactive about removing some of those suppressed or intermediate trees. But if it's not in the area, you don't think you're going to get attacked with it, then you have to decide whether you want to leave those or not. But it's still a good idea to keep your forest thin so the trees have room to grow and promote species diversity. I did mention that already, didn't I? I think I did. Look for the egg masses. And if you do, if you're harvesting trees or if you're just out in your forest, you can see these egg masses. Usually they're high up in the tree, but sometimes they might be low enough that you can see them. Keep an eye out for these things. Uh, if you do get, if you do see that you're getting some damage from defoliating insects like the gypsy moth, don't panic. Trees can handle a couple of years of defoliation and still survive. Some of them will put out new leaves right away. But if, you, if it's a heavy infestation, you get a lot of damage, you can ask for some spraying to be done. Either you can ask to have it done or you can do it yourself with this uh, insecticide called BTK. It's a hormonal insecticide rather than like a contact burning insecticide, but it kills anything that has like a larvae, any, any of the Lepidoptera family. Now, if you do that yourself, does that work from the bottom up? Or, I mean, you yeah. The, the, the question is if you do that yourself, can it, will it work? And it, it's hard to do it from yourself. Many times a spraying is done by airplanes. And that's, that's really the most effective way to get the whole population. But if it's like a small bush that you have that it's infested, it's, it can do, you might be able to do it yourself, or a small shrub. Small trees. The uh, encourage if you think you have it is to contact your local DNR forester. You can go to the DNR website, dnr.wi.gov, put in forest assistant locator, and find your county. They want to know if you have it. So contact them, and they can help confirm if you do have it, and then help to to get, uh, help you get the assistance you need if you need to spray. There's a great gypsy moth website, gypsymoth.wisconsin.gov. You can get a lot more information. Uh, or you can go or call this number or send an email if you think you have it to report any issues. Now, there are some good things going on with controlling gypsy moth beyond just spraying. Uh, we've released we. The, the people in charge have released a, a good agent out there to it's a, um, a virus that attacks gypsy moth that was brought in from where the gypsy moth are native. And this is a, when a gypsy moth look like this, in this picture are in a V formation, <laughs> or in a V form, uh, they've been killed by this particular virus. So it does work, 
There's been a lot of testing done with it, and it, it doesn't attack many other species, if not any other species. So it's, uh, you know, there's always that concern about you bring something in to kill something else that's been brought in, and those get out of hand, like the, um, the lady beetles that were brought in, and now they're a huge problem. I think we're a little better at it now, hopefully. <laughs> and so this, for this particular bug, it's, it's important to try to control its population the best we can. Here's another defoliating insect, the jack pine or the spruce budworm. It, it tends to attack jack pine species or spruce species. It doesn't feed on all of the needles in the tree. In fact, it feeds on some of them. Um, it's called haphazard defoliation, so it's kind of messy. Here's what the bug looks like eating the buds of this tree as it gets older. It uh, gets a real distinct color, has a black head with kind of a copper colored body and pairs of white dots going up its going up its body. It's a really neat looking bug in a picture on someone else's property, but if you have a whole bunch of them on your property, it's probably not that neat looking. It's a good idea to, if, if you do see this bug coming, to harvest your trees. That's when I talked about rotation age. For jack pine, it's one of those species, if you do have it on your property, it tends not to grow very old, and you tend to harvest it when it gets to be about 40 years old, so it's a good idea to start harvesting it. If you see it coming, or if you think you might have the budworm is to harvest it a little bit earlier maybe, so you can get value out of those trees and you don't create a big infestation of this bug. Uh, you can, you can uh, now the thing is, here's, here's where we talk about the balance. At the last session when I talked about managing for wildlife, I said plant your pine species farther apart so they're bushier longer, because that's great wildlife habitat. Here, for jack pine budworm, we say don't do that, do the opposite. And so this is the balance you have to take. You have to think about, well, I want more wildlife, but I don't want this bug to be killing my trees. Is it in the area? Maybe this is a good idea, time to talk to your local forester to see if this is an issue or not. And then there's that thing about promoting diversity. Did I mention that already? I might have mentioned that already. Promote diversity. All right, let's move on to those root diseases. There's a few of them out there to be aware of. It, the tree tends to look, uh, lose vigor, fewer living branches, and then eventually dies. Some of them create, uh, um, when you chop off the bark, you'll see this white stuff underneath the bark. That's characteristic of a certain disease. And in fact, at night, when you flash a light on it, it's like an iridescent color. It's really neat. Well, on someone else's property, <laughs> that's the time to see that. Uh, one of those diseases is the anosum root disease. It uh, tends to attack conifer trees. The trees will start to get lose vigor, lose their leaves, the needles and branches will die, and, and pretty soon you'll have this, all these trees dying in a pocket. It's in some of the counties in the state, in the state not all of them. Uh, you find the, the fruiting body is right below the soil line. As you can see in the picture on the lower left, the top, of the picture, the top is the soil line, and, if you, and you, they dug down about six inches to where that mushroom is. That's where it tends to grow. So if, you're, if your pines are dying and you're not sure in why, you can dig down a little bit into the soil and see if you can find a mushroom that looks like this. Or when, it's kind of, when it breaks off into what's called the popcorn stage and is scattered around on the forest floor, that's another indication. If you're not sure your pines are dying, you're not sure why, it might be this thing and something to keep an eye out for. It's, it's uh, spread in a couple of ways. It can be, it's usually uh, the, the spores are in the air and they land on freshly cut Wound, uh, trees or on wounds on the trees, and they infest the tree and then they spread. They can spread from tree to tree when, by the root system. So uh, trees will, especially of the same species, the root system, if they're near to each other, will graft together. There's an advantage to that because they create this one big root system and they can share all the resources then from a wide area. The disadvantage is that diseases can spread from tree to tree really quickly via that root system. And so that's what goes on. This is one of those diseases that takes advantage of that. And so if one tree in a pine grove gets infected with a nosum, it can spread pretty quickly to other trees. And that's true for something else I'll talk about later. So there's things you can do about it. Um, having a little bit of diversity in your stand is a good idea. I may have mentioned that. Uh, there's things, if, if you do harvest trees in the summer, there's some things you can treat the stumps with, called a couple of products called Sporex and Cellutrite. I don't get any kickbacks from those companies for mentioning their products. They're good products and they're very commonly used. And uh, this landowner is, using, is spreading the Sporex on the stumps of the cut trees to prevent them from getting infected from a no -sum. The uh, During certain times of the years, 
uh, the loggers will put a canister of the stuff on the harvesting head of their equipment. And so when the chainsaw goes through the tree, it spreads this sporax or the cellutrete right on the stump while it's cutting. And so you can, if you do harvest, if, if you are harvesting pines in the summer when there, and there's and the nosum is in the area, you can ask that this be done or this kind of treatment be put on onto the stumps while the trees are being harvested. A couple of more wilt diseases. These are also root-based diseases. The trees on the left are uh, American elm that are dying. <laughs> there's not many of them out in the landscape anymore because Dutch elm disease has killed a lot of them off. It's a wilt disease. It's one of those that attacks the roots and kills the tree that way. Oak wilt, the picture on the right, is another one of those. Here's where the infestation is in Wisconsin. There's, uh, you'll see that there's some in Oneida County near Rhinelander. I swear that wasn't me. The uh, most of it is, eventually I'm guessing it'll spread throughout the state. So even though there's areas that are in white that haven't an infestation yet or hasn't been discovered yet, they'll probably get everywhere in the state. That doesn't mean that every oak tree is going to be infected. It just means that there's been discovered in most of those towns. What happens is that the, the leaves will turn color either fully to brown or partially to brown and fall off the tree. And it happens uh, usually in uh, between June and August is when you'll see this kind of damage. And it can happen, well, the damage can look similar to the damage done by two-line chestnut borer. The adult picture is the upper left. Can you guess why they call it two-line chestnut borer? The, the bottom left-hand corner is the larvae again, has those kind of round segments on the end and then um, regular segments in the middle. It looks similar to oak wilt, but the damage takes a bit longer to manifest itself. And if your oaks are drying, it's a good idea to, are dying, are dying to pull off the bark and see if you can find the galleries underneath the bark and this particular larvae. But oak wilt happens really fast. So this is, take a look at this tree, the, the branches in the upper left-hand corner. This is three days later. That's how fast the tree can change. Uh -huh. Just that fast. Chestnut, or the uh, two-line chestnut borer will take a lot longer to kill the tree. But oak wilt can be just that fast. So it's a good idea to keep an eye out for this thing. And if you do find it, to get, get it off your property so that it doesn't spread to surrounding oaks or surrounding other trees. Now it can spread in two different ways. It can spread over land via uh, the spores that land on a wound of the tree. So that's why we say harvest in the winter and prune in the winter when the trees are dormant. There's a particular uh, number of insects that are attracted to wounded, wounded trees or the wounds themselves, like in the lower left-hand corner of the left picture, there's some beetles that are feeding on the sap from a wound on a tree. Now, if those beetles had trans have just been on a tree that had oak wilt, they'd be carrying the spores of the disease on their body, and they've just infested this new wound. So this is, it's a small percentage of oaks are infested this way, like 5 to 10 percent. More often than not, they're infested by, or infected by the transmit from one tree to another by this underground root system that's, where they're, that's connected. So that's why if you see a tree that's looked like it's dying, try to identify it quickly if it's oak wilt and get it off your property. And you may have to harvest a few of the surrounding trees because they've already been infested, they're just not showing it yet. And in fact, in some areas where the, like a, a city park where the trees are very highly valued, they don't want to kill all their trees or harvest all their trees, they'll, they'll dig trenches all the way around the trees and, and cut all those root grafts so it doesn't spread any farther. Can you imagine how expensive that is? You don't need to do that on your property. You just harvest a few trees and you might need to do it a bit wider than, than you think, take some trees that you wouldn't like to, but that'll stop the spread of the disease. Best bet though is um, if you're gonna do some harvesting on your property, do it when the trees aren't actively growing, when they're dormant. If you can avoid the summer, that's great. Anything all the way through March, the entire growing season, that's even better. Uh, don't move firewood off from someone else's property into yours. It could be carrying the disease or be carrying the bugs that have the disease on their bodies. You can treat. If you do have to do some harvesting or maybe you had some damage and you have to do a salvage cut or something, you can treat the stumps of the tree so that they don't uh, get infected. You only have to treat the, uh, the growing part of the, of the wood, and that's like the outer rings. And that's why you see in this picture, the, they've treated this stump, and it's just the blue part is where they've, uh, that's the actively growing part of the tree that's, that's not dead yet. Like the center of the tree is basically dead. It's just a structural part of the tree, but the outside, le the outside of the wood is still actively transporting sugars and water. So if you just treat that outside part, like if you have a big stump, you don't have to paint the whole stump with this. 
with a, a treatment. You can just do the, the growing part of the tree and that'll prevent it from becoming infested by oak wilt. And there's different things you can use. Uh, there's a, a wound paint that you can get from like a, a nursery or a garden store. Some people will just cover it with paint. Like if they cut off a branch, they cover the, the, the wound with a paint. That works pretty well too. All right, there are some canker diseases out there. You've seen both of these pictures already. As I said, that one on the right, that's got a lot of character, uh, that, but that tree won't live very long. And that disease can spread to other trees, so you might get more trees that have the same kind of canker on it. This one's called a Eutapella canker on the right. There's it takes different forms as well. At, at a previous session, you've seen, we saw, I showed these pictures. The, on the right, it's called black knot, uh, those kind of black knotty looking, <laughs> hence the name. Uh, infestation, infestations on the trees, it's a good idea to cut those off, get them off your property or burn those trees so that infestation doesn't spread to other trees. The problem with the Eutapella canker is that it, it won't necessarily kill the tree by itself, but it could lead to a secondary infection. And that white fungus growth in the middle of the picture is that secondary infection. And that thing is going to kill the tree. The Eutapella canker by itself probably won't kill the tree. It'll be ugly and it, it'll slow the growth, but it won't kill the tree. And the tree will last a long time with that. But that secondary infection will kill the tree. And it may look like this. In this picture, it might have uh, it's called a mossy top conch because it, it can grow some moss on the top of it. You see in this picture, that will kill the tree. So prevent wounding by thinning in the winter. Try not to, when you're dropping trees, try not to hit other trees so you create wounds in those. Now it's easy for me to say only uh, harvest trees in the winter. Obviously loggers have to work all year round. It's, it's a chance you take. It's a better chance for your trees to get infected with something in the growing season than it is in the winter. But we harvest trees all the time in the summer, and we just take a chance. And if it, many times it's a very low chance because those, those diseases aren't in the area. Like we might have oak wilt in the county that uh, our property is located in, but it might not be anywhere near. And if we do the harvest right, we don't cause any secondary damage, and we treat the stumps, we should be OK. So you can do harvesting in the summer, um, but it's best to do it in the winter. And if you can do that, swing that with the log you work with, or if you're doing harvesting from firewood, do it when the trees are dormant. Or if you're doing pruning of your trees, do it when the trees are dormant. That's the best way to avoid any kind of infestation. Um, I may have mentioned diversity before, did I? I can't remember. I may have mentioned that. There are some other uh, diseases out there that infect leaves. Many times these aren't really that bad. They look really bad, but they're not that bad. And I'll go through uh, one of them in particular called anthracnose. It looks like that the leaves are being burnt, like the pictures on the right. It's, it's not that bad. It, it looks worse than it really is, actually. It uh, tends to be if you have really wet spring, you get more of this kind of damage. It tends to be in the lower part of the canopy where the highest humidity is, but it won't kill the tree. So don't worry about it. If it happens, it's, it's actually very common. Um, if you can, promote diversity, keep your forest thinned. Your trees will be healthy and they'll be fine. And we do have some decay in our forest. We need to have some decay, otherwise we'll have trees piled up forever and they never will break down. So there has to be some, some fungus in our forest to some degree. Not If we have a lot of it, if every tree we have has some kind of a mushroom growing out of the side of it, like in these pictures, that's bad. But a few trees is, is good. We need that stuff. We need the, uh, the dying trees to attract some insects and birds that are eating them so that we can keep these populations down and in control. So it's okay to have some decay on your property. It does, it's not going to hurt the, there's always going to be some decay, whether it's on the ground or standing trees. So it's okay to have it. I wouldn't worry about it too much. We want some of it. Like I said, they usually start from a wound source of some kind. Maybe a branch breaks off and that's where the wound starts or the decay gets into the tree. Some species are more susceptible to it than others. If you ever uh, had a birch tree on the ground, it, you realize how fast it takes for that thing to break down before it's just empty and hollow and you just have the bark. It might be a year before that, the thing is gone. Whereas an oak or a, a, a maple branch on the ground will last forever, breaks down really slow. So some trees are more susceptible, break down more quickly or, or uh, um, the fungus eats them up more quickly than others. So I'm starting to sound like a broken record. You know, avoid wounds, thin in the winter, don't let your trees get old. Uh, 
but leave some on the on your property. A few trees is okay. And we talked about when we we're managing for wildlife, like one to tree, standing dead trees or snags is okay. But not, you know, whole forest of those is bad. Like this, this is a good example. One dead tree among all these living ones, that's pretty good. Now if it was the other way around, one living tree with all dead ones, that's no good. So that's, have a bit of a balance. A few dead trees is okay. For, is great for wildlife habitat, but not too many. One to, one to six per acre is about a good a rule of thumb. All right, let's move on to some other things beyond insects and diseases. Weather can take many different forms in how it kills our trees. Some of the biggest change agents in our state are big storms, uh, big ice storm, big wind storms, uh, lightning, hail, all those things can kill our trees pretty quickly or damage them. That creates uh, an avenue for other diseases to get in. Just keep an eye out for this stuff. And if, you, if a big windstorm comes through or a big hailstorm comes through or ice storm, sometimes they can be localized and they can be big events. Keep an idea of that, make, write it down on your calendar and then check your trees to see if there's damage because it might not be this year that you see damage, but those trees that were hit by a heavy wind may have cracked and all of a sudden there's an avenue for a disease to get in or an insect to get in. And so that it might be a year or two later on that the trees might start dying. And if you remember, oh yeah, we had that big storm two years ago. The trees seemed to be okay, but they were damaged. So you just gotta keep an eye on these things and, and keep track of when they happen and think about if you, something is happening in the future, it might be related to these events. Hail can be an issue. I hope none of us are encounter hail like in the top left-hand corner. <laughs> I wouldn't want to get my car be hit by that. Uh, it can call, cause very small wounds in trees especially thin bark trees can be uh, affected heavily by hail. Like in the right hand picture, it was just a small wound, but that's a point of infection for uh, insects or diseases. So if you do get some hail, keep an eye on if there's trees that have been damaged, maybe those are the ones you harvest first so that they don't become a point of infection for other things. Or see if, that, if they do become uh, like the windstorm, if, if later on they're all of a sudden they're dying, it might have been from the hail that happened a while ago. Wind damage can take a couple of forms. It can knock down a tree completely or tip them over or it can break them off at the top. Neither case, neither of these pictures would be fun to have to clean up to get the trees out of there. You can get a salvage harvest done where a logger will come in and try to get as much of the merchantable wood out of there. If it's a big scale thing, if it's a small scale, you might be able to do it yourself. If you can, try to clean it up as quickly as you can because those trees could, are just screaming that we're hurt and are attracting things that will break them down or cause an infection, infestation that you might not want. Flooding can be an issue depending on a number of things. If it's, the trees are dormant, flooding doesn't, tends not to be a big issue. If, uh, and it depends on how long the, the, the trees are submerged. If it's just a few hours, it's not a big issue. If it's a couple days, it might not be an issue. If it tends to be a week or longer, all of a sudden you might have some damage. Uh, some species are more sensitive to uh, flooding or being for the soil to be saturated with water. And that's what's going on is that the, in their soil, um, there's small air spaces within it. And that's where the, the roots have to have some air spaces for them to exchange gases, because they do breathe, they respirate. And if all those air spaces are filled with water, the roots can't breathe. And so they can hold their breath for a short amount of time, but not for a very long time. And eventually those roots will die and the trees will die. So that's why, and, and that's, uh, that's why I say it depends on how long the flooding is. Some soils, tend to have, for it to be more of a problem in if you have a sandy soil, the water tends to drain out pretty quickly and it's not as much of an issue, but if you have a heavy soil, maybe a lot of clay or a silt, then it, the water tends to hang in the soil much longer and it can be more damaging. Um, younger, healthier trees tend to handle flooding much better than older, stressed trees. So what did I mention? What are those things I mentioned? Thinner forest, diversity, those are important things. Those things will work well for uh, protecting your forest from flooding as well. Ice, heavy ice and snow can be a big issue, especially if it starts to breaking off branches. Those can be sites of infection sometime in the future too or that can cause the trees to be stressed. So if you, if you do have trees that have broken branches due to heavy snow or ice load, you might want to harvest them so that they don't become a problem in the future. Uh, frost can be an issue for many species. Uh, 
some of the hardwoods will, will re-sprout their leaves. You can see that in the left-hand picture. The first sprout or the first flush of leaves were damaged by frost. And then that you can see there's a new growth coming in right underneath that as it puts out some new leaves to, to try to recover from the frost damage. Very common, and we have frost, late frost in, our, in Wisconsin all the time, so trees are, have grown and adapted to that. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. For conifer trees, you can get a different kind of damage called a winter burn, where if, the, if we get a warm spell and a cold spell, the warm spell causes the needles to lose moisture, and then it get really cold and it can get a, the needles can die and burn. And so you'll get, like in the right-hand picture, all the, most of the needles on the inside of the tree are dead, and you have all living needles on the outside. It kind of looks like um, a poodle that was just shaved, and you have a big puffy tail and puffy feet, and the rest of it's really, uh, really shaved close. Uh, an analogy might not work very well, but that's what you're going to see. You're going to see the tree is just new growth on the outside of it and all dead needles on the inside. Uh, many trees are susceptible to salt from road salting uh, that gets into the soil and the trees take it up and they die. Pines are especially susceptible to this, so if you, I wouldn't, you know, maybe if you do have pines along roads that are heavily salted, you might want to change them out to something else. That's because that salt is going to be in your soil for a long time. So you need to find something that can handle high salinity soils. And there are many species that can do that. On the other end of the spectrum from flooding is drought, and droughts are very common in Wisconsin. It stresses the trees. Uh, if it's, the drought is too long, the, the trees can die from it. Uh, it, it tends to, the roots tend to be more heavily affected by drought than anything else. The, the fine root hairs, uh, the fine hairs on the roots uh, really need to be, that's what absorbs most of the moisture. And if you have heavy drought, the, the tree tends to lose those and its ability to, so, to take up water from the soil is reduced, and, and, and so it kind of starves to death to some degree. And if it's a combination of uh, frost, heavy frost and drought, that can be a, a one-two punch for many trees. If there's, a, if there's soil moisture, if there's a lot of soil moisture, then uh, when the frost comes in in the winter, it kind of protects the roots from damage. But if all that soil moisture is gone because of a drought, the root hairs are exposed, and so when frost comes in, it tends to kill all those roots. So as I said, a one-two punch. But there isn't, there isn't a, a, a good cycle that we can point to that says you're going to have drought these years and heavy, drought, heavy rains the next year. It can be all over the place. And you can see some, we have some, there's not a real pattern going on here. So there's some years that have heavy, many years in a row with heavy drought, like in the Dust Bowl years. Or there's one year that has a heavy drought, like the 1977, it was a really heavy duty drought. And then there's all kinds of years where there's a lot of rain. There's not a real pattern to this. So it's going to happen. We're going to get both ends of the spectrum eventually throughout our lifetime. So we just need to be prepared. If your trees are healthy and they're growing well, you should be fine whether a drought comes or if you have heavy rains. Now, we tend to do a lot of damage to our forests, either by misapplication of, uh, of chemicals or just by driving too much on the roots of the trees that can kill them. Like this case, you can see the muffler to the truck is close to the top of this tree and killed it. So said something very simple like that can be damaging to our trees. I showed these pictures already. Spraying herbicide in a windy day managed to kill all these different kinds of trees. If you're careful with the things you do, your trees will be fine. Um, when you're not careful or you're swinging a chainsaw around because it's fun, you can do damage to the trees. That was a terrible example. I apologize. Uh, fire is a common thing here in Wisconsin. We have hundreds of fires every year. I might have mentioned this at a previous class. Some fires can be small, they can be on the ground. Some can be big, like in this picture where they, they destroyed whole big parts of the forest. Uh, what happens is that there are some areas of the forest that aren't affected, that haven't been burned, and so they're still kind of standing and living, but they've been stressed. And you can kind of see that in this picture. There's some of the trees are complete, like on the left side, are completely burned, but in the middle of that, of that road, there's some trees that look like they're still green. Like, oh, they did fine, they survived. But in fact, they were probably really stressed by that fire and will eventually succumb to other things that come in after the fire. So as I said, you can have small fires. They can be, uh, we respond to them. We, we put out a lot, of, a lot of the local fire departments work hard in the fire season, as do our DNR foresters and rangers. Big fires, we, we do have some big fires in the state. 
Here's one of these insects that, that come in at, and attack the stressed trees after a fire, the red turpentine beetle. You get this very characteristic uh, pitch from an attack from, the, uh, the pitching out is called, is, uh, or pitch tubes, is a way for the tree to respond to the attack of an insect. They'll try to, you can think of them as spitting out. They'll just fl try to flush the insect out of the, out, of their, out of the trunk of the tree by using a lot of sap to just kind of flush it out, or pitching it out, it's called. These uh, orange pitch tubes are very common occurrence following a red turpentine beetle attack. There's things you can do to protect your property from wildfires, especially your structures. You can see this, this was a big fire that took place, but yet that house and the surrounding buildings are fine because they took some steps to protect themselves from a wildfire. Um, I got a publication over there that I'll, that I'll, uh, talks a bit about the things you can do. They're really simple. You don't have a lot of trees around your house. You don't have them packed together. You prune up the bottom portion of the tree so that fire can't climb up into the trees. You don't store your firewood right next to the house. I've seen pictures of people that, <laughs> I have this great picture of a house that they have all the walls of the house are, have firewood stacked next to it. Now all I think of is like, well, that's just, they just put all that fuel right around their house and one match of this dried wood is gonna destroy their whole property. And so if you can store your firewood and other fuels you have away from your house, that's a good thing. It's very simple things you can do to protect your home from wildfires. And making your driveway wide enough so that emergency vehicles, vehicles can get in there is also a good thing to do. All right, let's talk a bit about other things out there that are gonna kill your trees. Birds and mammals, um, usually they cause damage to certain parts of the tree. Sometimes it's cosmetic, depending on the size of the tree, they can handle it. If it's a small tree, it can kill it. But for big trees, it's mostly cosmetic. Here's one that's uh, not cosmetic. Uh, this was the picture on the left is of a plantation where they planted alternating rows of white pine and red oak. So you can see that mo row in the middle of red oak didn't really do very well. And in fact, the circle is of a red oak tree. So those others, white pine are doing great. The red oak, and the picture on the right is one of those that was planted. It's just getting hammered by the deer. It puts up a new shoot every year and the deer eat it down to the ground. Puts up a new shoot, deer eat down to the ground. And it becomes just little bushes like the picture on the right. They'll survive a quite a long time like that where they're just putting out new trees and then deer eat them down to the ground. So if you can, try to protect them. There's a number of things you can do to protect trees from deer damage. Um, a really simple thing you can do, if you've planted trees and you want to protect them, you're investing a lot in those trees, it's a good idea to take some steps to protect them from damage. And putting what's called a bud cap on them to protect them, like in the picture on the left, is a simple and cheap thing to do. It's basically just a piece of cardboard that you staple over the top or the end of the branch. Should I go through that again? It's a piece of cardboard, you fold it over, over the top branch, you staple it there. You put it on in the fall, you take it off in the spring. It protects, the deer all, it protects from the deer all winter. It's a really simple, cheap thing to do. And you can do it, it, the important bud to cover is the one on the top, because you want your trees to get tall enough so that they get above where the deer can browse them. And so if you do that every, every winter, you put these bud caps on, you take them off in the spring, the tree will continue to grow and get tall enough so that the deer can't kill them completely. And you can do it on the very top one. The very top one's the most important, but you can do it on the side ones as well. It's cheap and simple. It's a lot cheaper than using a uh, repellent like, like the ones in this graph. I, don't, I put this information up there. Someone did a study on how effective these different repellents are. Mixed bag of, of effectiveness. Many times a repellent, you, after it's rained, you have to reapply them. Some of them you put into the ground and they're taken up by the tree, but the, the deer has to still bite on it. To, to see, and before they realize it doesn't taste well, they're still taking a part of the tree off. So it does a pretty good job of keeping the deer from eating the whole tree, but they're still gonna take a bite out of it. Is that for deciduous and conifer? Yeah, it, and the question is, it, does it, the repellents work for both deciduous and coniferous trees? And in fact, yes, they do. Okay. And it can, um, but really the best thing, if you're planting a tree, the bud caps are the best thing to do. They're cheap and they're easy. But if you're gonna go with a repellent, there's, you have to do it like I said, if it rains, you usually have to apply them again. Um, if you want to learn more about controlling deer damage, you go to our website, the learning store, ux.edu. We have a great pub called Controlling Deer Damage in Wisconsin. That, uh, the, really, the best thing is to exclude the deer with a fence. It's, it's, it's not cheap, but that's the best way to do it. And, and some people say that the, the fence has to be at least 10 feet because the deer will jump right over anything shorter than that. And I've seen it on my property. I've got a five-foot fence. And um, 
I left the door open one night and came in the morning and there were the deer was in there and I chased it out and jumped right over the, the five foot fence. So. But it's, it's not cheap, but that's the best way to go. Uh, there's other things out there that chew on our trees. Mice and voles are, will, in the winter, underneath the snow, like, they'll feed on the, the growing part of the tree right underneath the bark. And here's, this tree was eating basically everything was eating as much as the as high as the, the snowpack. The voles and the mice had a, a good meal on this particular tree. So what you do is you try to control the, the population. There's always going to be mice and voles out there in our, in our fields and in our forests. So it's going to be tough to get rid of them all. But you can keep their populations low by doing some simple things. If you've got planted trees, um, it's a good idea to mow around them or spray an herbicide around the base of them so that they don't have any cover and so pr predators can get them pretty easily. And uh, you can leave a few standing trees in the middle of the fields or where, where your trees are planted so that predators have a place to perch. Some people even create a perch by putting a 4x4, like a 10 foot tall 4x4 on the ground and putting a cross piece over the top of it so like hawks and owls have a place to perch and then they can hunt those voles and mice pretty easily. Um, the less, the more exposed you can make them, the better. There's always gonna, they're always going to be there, but if you can keep your population low, you have a better chance of reducing the amount of damage they do. Porcupines can be an issue. This, they tend to be more of a cosmetic damage. They don't necessarily will kill the tree. Uh, there's, you can control their population if they're a pest on your property, but um, more often than not, they, they're not a big issue. They're not a big problem. If they're chewing on your house like they do in my place, uh, you can put up we just put up some hardware cloth over the bottom part of the wood so that they wouldn't chew on it, or you can put up um, sheet metal just to keep them from chewing on it. It's not very attractive, but the chewed up wood isn't very attractive either, and it's, it's fun for them to walk by and not being able to eat anything. So, Sap suckers can be a bit of a problem. The key for sap suckers is if you, if you find a tree that they're attacking, leave it because they tend to come back to the same tree over and over again. So if you see one attacking a tree, don't cut it down and hopefully that, that'll get rid of it. You know, they'll keep coming to the same tree over and over again. And it's very typical damages. They, they tend to um, feed like in a row, up and down or side to side, leave those trees, and the tree will probably survive for a long time. And so that, and you'll protect your other trees because of uh, you're leaving their your feeding tree for them to continue to eat on. Rabbits are also something that tend to be a problem. The way that their teeth are arranged, that the, when they chew off a branch, it's, it cuts like a knife at a 45 degree angle, whereas deer teeth, uh, they tend to come together. I think it's because they're offset or deer teeth come together. It's a more of a, a ripping off or, or tearing of the branch. And so you get a rougher cut. So that's how you can tell the difference if it's a deer or a rabbit, especially if it's a small tree. A rabbit's like a knife cut at a 45 degree angle and the deer tend to be a rougher kind of biting. Squirrels can cause a lot of damage too, red or gray squirrels. More often than not, it's red squirrels. They can shear the bark off, trying to get at the, the cones that are coming in, or then they can, they can chew the, on the growing layer of the growing tissue underneath the bark. And so new growth can be falling off on the ground. That's very common. They tend not to kill the trees but it can be unsightly and it, and it can be a point of infection. If uh, you're, some people will stable or let their livestock graze underneath the, their trees, it can have a, big of an, a bit of an issue in that uh, the livestock can impact the soil, especially if it's a very concentrated area. They tend to, some of them eat the bark or rub off the bark. Uh, one thing to think about is that like, a, like a, a steer or a cow or a horse, they're, they're heavy animals and their hooves aren't that big. And so all of their weight is concentrated on that one spot or those four stop, spots. And so they, they, their ability to compact soil is a lot more, is much more than say a big piece of harvesting equipment whose tires are this wide or the tracks in their vehicle are this wide. The, the pounds per square inch are much less with those vehicles than they are for a horse or, or, a, or a steer. So you might not think, well, they're just walking around and not causing much damage, but in fact, they, they can be compacting the soil pretty heavily, just by, if, especially if they're in a confined area. Okay, here's the problems we have with improper planting of trees. They can take a number of different forms. If you're planting bare root seedlings, these are the kind you might get from a nursery, especially a DNR nursery. 
The best thing to do is have a hole big enough. Well, let me back up. When I was, uh, as a young forester, I did a lot of tree planting and the instructions that I got were one to a hole, green side up. Sure, that works great. It's a little bit more involved than that. If the hole has to be big enough so the roots can hang loosely in it, and um, you need to prune the roots so that they're not too much. If you, when you get it from the nursery, the roots can be really long, and the top of the tree can only be this big. So you need to prune them down a little bit. And they need to let hang loosely in the hole, and then you just pack them up, and they'll be fine. If you don't plant them deep enough, you get what's called J-rooting. The roots will kind of go in, a, in the tree into a J-shape. They're trying to find a way to, to get uh, to spread out, and they don't, the tree will die from that. If you prune too much, like the middle picture, it took way too much of the roots there. That's, the tree won't survive that way. Or if you just jam the roots into a hole and hope it'll be fine, they won't do that. They tend to wrap around each other and choke the, the life out of the tree. So hanging loose, the big enough hole, hanging loosely, and pack the soil around. More often, many times we plant trees that are in a container or in a big ball. Those are a little bit different. You still need a big hole and loosen up the soil. And you, it's a good idea to uh, free those roots so that they're, if they're in a ball or they're in a container, many times the roots have kind of wrapped around, so you might have to cut the roots and then can spread them out a little bit so that they, they, they grow outwards rather than growing inwards into the tree and, and the tree will die that way too. But the key is to, to do the things I've already mentioned. You know, if, you keep, if you promote diversity, thin your forest so the trees have room to grow, then you'll be, you should be fine. There's going to be some insects and diseases that come to your property. It's, it's inevitable. They're already out there. But if you do these things, you should be fine and your trees will continue to grow. They might have an infestation, you might get a few insects and diseases, but you can take steps. If you're monitoring and keep an eye on the situation, you should be able to control them when you see them early. And that's the key, finding them when they're early. So like I said, get out there for the if invasive species are there too. Find those infestations early and you can take care of them when they're small before they become big and a problem. Uh, the, there is a lot of help out there. And I encourage you if, you have, if you're not sure what you have if you, or what's going on, if you think you have a sick tree, call the local DNR forester. You're paying for them with your taxes. You might as well you, utilize their system. If you, even if it's just to ask them a question, you might be able to get them to come out to your property if you can convince them that the, the problem is big enough. You can find your local DNR forester by going to the DNR website and typing in forestry assistance locator. There's forest health specialists out there around the state that can help you. They, um, I'll show you a picture of who they are in a second. When you go to the forest health section of the DNR website, you can find their contact information too. Now, when I talk to DNR foresters about problems like this, the issues that I've talked about tonight, they say, OK, that's great. If it's, it tends to be a yard tree, it's a good idea to call someone else, because they specialize more in forested trees. So if you have a yard tree problem, it's a good idea to contact your local extension office. They have horticultural agents in each county most of the time, and they can help answer questions about crab apple or some cultivar of maple that you're having a problem with. And the, the urban problems tend to be a di bit different than many of the forestry problems out there. You can also pay some money to people, either an arborist or an urban forester, and to, to take a look at your trees. But there are some people out there that can help you for free. I encourage you to contact them. The, uh, the forest health specialists, here they are around the, the state. You can write down their name for the county that your property is in. Go to the DNR website and, and go to the staff directory and type that in. You can get their, all, all their contact information. I think they're, the plan is to fill that vacant spot sometime in the future. They're being, right now it's being covered by people like uh, Paul, Paul Segan and, and Mike Hillstrom are covering those counties. So if you do have land in that yellow top center part of the state, if that's where your property is, uh, either Mike or Paul can answer your questions. As I said, go to the DNR website. There's a under contact us, there's a staff directory, and you can type in their name, either Hillstrom or Segan or Williams. And then that's how you can get their contact information. Getting it. And they're happy. They want to hear about this too. They, they love their, their geeks about insects and diseases. So if you got something you're not sure about, give them a call or send them a picture. They love that too. Then Because it, they cover a big area and they can't get everywhere. You can send them, take a picture with your phone and send it to them. That they're happy to help diagnose or, or start a diagnosis based on that. So get out there. So I'm giving you a charge. My charge is to get out there and have fun in your forest and keep an eye out for stuff too. How about that? I'm telling you to get out in your forest. Isn't that, isn't that great? Yeah.
keep an eye out for this kind of stuff. Uh, look for those signs and symptoms. Think about the time of year that they, you, that's, the trees are most susceptible and when, they're most, when these things are out there and when you might see the damage. Uh, keep an eye out for them, including the, the invasive plants too, and then get some help if you need it. Right? I'm telling you you have to go out in your woods. Is that a bad thing? No, I hope not. All right, with that, thanks for coming, guys. I appreciate your time here this evening, and uh, hopefully you don't get any of the insects and diseases we talked about. <laughs>